Hello everyone, this is Steve Marinucci with our special Beatles White Album show for Beatle News Briefs. Um, it is November 7th, uh, two days before the release of the box set. And I'm here with, I actually have a special an announcement to make. I'm here with our Beatle News Briefs contributing editor, Candy Leonard, author of Beatleness, who will be a regular guest on our show, um, and talking about various, you know, various uh, uh, issues and pieces of history uh, regarding the Beatles. Uh, Candy, welcome back, and and glad to have you uh, talking about this. Well, thank you, Steve. I am thrilled to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, what's more fun than talking about the Beatles? Right. Um, I know, listening to the Beatles. Listening to the Beatles. <laughs> Candy and I both have been listening to uh, advanced copies of the new um, White Album set. Um, I've had mine a little longer than she has had access to hers, but we both have spent God knows how much time listening. Um, and we can get into specific tracks um, a little bit later, but just in general, Candy, what did, what did you think? Well, it definitely uh, pops in a way that the other one, I don't want to say didn't, because of course that's the, you know, like, that's the baseline, right? That's what we mm-hmm. compare. But, but yes, it, it, it has a, it's cleaner, it's brighter. I, I would compare, you know, I, it's the same way I felt about the Pepper uh, uh, rem- you know, remaster that it, it just you can hear every layer more clearly but miraculously it doesn't sound cluttered I mean that's the thing that's so amazing and, and speaks to the the um, elegance of this you know it is mm-hmm. like there was this you can hear I mean you can always sort of hear that there are a lot a lot going on but you hear a little bit more going on and the stuff that you kind of always heard is a little bit, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. I'm not sure that the um, the the change is as pronounced as it was on Pepper. Um, Probably not. Yeah, I, I, perhaps not. But here and there, uh, of course, now once I say that, I have to give an example. But... Um, there are moments that, you know, you sort of, well, I don't know what the, the hearing equivalent of a double take is like, wow, what did I just hear? You know, mm-hmm. it's, um, it's very, I would say one of the things that stand out for me is the vocals. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the voices of these guys, I mean, are just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Just unbelievable. <laughs> now see, on, on, uh, I kind of, um, I kind of disagree with you. Not disagree, but um, the first thing I noticed was mm-hmm. listening to the instruments on "Dear Prudence." Yes, yes, and that was, and because I was, I was actually, I was in my car and I was listening to. How again? You're right. How clear it was, but it was just you could hear the the you could hear everything, and it was the 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 one thing. And I was mentioning this to uh, Ken Mansfield, who we have interviews uh, with uh, in this show, and um, and he was and and I was saying how the one thing that you really notice about the new mix, and I don't know if it's it's just something that you just noticed is that is the way that they they played together is the integralness of yeah. the musicianship um it's really apparent in the in the new mix uh but yeah it, it it's definitely there's definitely that change and it it really gets it really gets kind of it really is interesting how you know how this thing um how this thing sounds i've heard other people say that 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 uh, have heard it that it's not the life changer that Pepper was, and that's po- possibly true. But it's 
there is definitely a difference. There's no, there's no question about it. And we can get into the we can get into the the other tracks l later. But the al the the album itself, there's definitely some, there's definitely differences there. It's it is cleaner, like you say. Um, I mean, would the average person? I don't even know what that means. But you know, look, I mean, I, well, of course, this raises the question of who is this being marketed to? Who is who's who's buying this? But not even I'm not even talking about the super deluxe. I'm talking about even just the the remaster of the 30 songs itself and whatever gets thrown in if you get that. But um, I mean, do, just would. You know, does it, does it take a Beatle nerd to notice these things? Would the average listener notice them? I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't. It, it's hard. I have no idea. What do you think? Well, having, I mean, I I spent some time listening to the 2009 mix, and then I put the new one on. And yeah, there is. You definitely you can hear it back to back. I'm not sure that if you put the you know, I, I don't. I'm not sure that if you put the older one on, you're gonna you're gonna say, "Oh, this sounds awful," because nobody ever. I don't remember ever. I don't remember ever complaining about the the. Well, of course, that, that's the whole thing. I mean, you know, it's like how do you improve on perfection? You know, in other words, like, mm -hmm. you know, which gets into the whole question of the whole enterprise itself. Um, you know, because obviously the, there are different opinions about, you know, why do this? What and and of course. You know the the different op opinions about putting out, selecting first of all, selecting from the huge stockpile of outtakes, and then to put them out. So, but yeah, I mean, it's already it, right. It's not like you listen to the other one and it sounds crappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the feels anyway. So, right. But it does sound better. But if you if you like played it for somebody who you know maybe hasn't heard the White Album for, you know two or three decades, which is believe, I mean, there are people out there like that, we forget that, but let's say you played it for somebody you knew in high school or some old friend who had, who's not into the Beatles like you are and hadn't heard this record for 30 years, would they say, wow, who, you know, like, it's interesting what, you know, like, what that experience would be like, you know what I mean, like, would they be wowed by it? I don't, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's, it's, it's crazy. I'll tell you that I mean, I I wish I could say I had a, you know, a, a system like a, um, you know, like they had at Capitol Records when I was there a few weeks ago to hear the little preview that we heard. Uh, but what I heard in, in that room that day, and I mean, this is a recording studio, uh, you know, professional recording studio with probably one of the best sound systems in the world, was absolutely stunning. Yeah, um, I yeah. I mean, we're not it's only as good as your speaker, ultimately, isn't it? Also, I, mean? I, su I suppose, I suppose. Uh, or although, is that, less, is that less true with digital music? I don't know. Maybe that's well. The, it, 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 the the thing is, though, that I think you know, headphones are are kind of an optimum thing for listening. Anyway, um, I've always you know enjoyed listening to stuff on headphones, and listening even listening you know through a you know through a low you know a, a low end headset which i have been doing with 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 the new set, with the new set it sounds it sounds good um you know it kind of envelops you yeah it does, uh, in, it does. in if you listen to it that way so yeah i think it i think it is good and i should remind people that for those who aren't who who can't look at the super deluxe set it is available as a 3 CD and I don't know how many album set with just the new mix and the the Easter demos and that I got to I got to remember to say that Easter somebody told me a while back that it was Easter and I almost didn't believe him and then when I was talking with Giles Martin who you will also hear in this show um and he said it, and he said it in the session, and he said it to me later. Yes, it's definitely Escher. I had to kind of laugh, you know, because it looks like Escher, but it's not. Um, but anyway, um, so it, if you buy, if, if you don't, if you can't get the deluxe set with the outtakes, you can at least get the CDs and the vinyl with the Escher demos. You can also get the vinyl by itself, 
or the the vinyl mix by itself. But they uh, they um, the, but um, the, their pro their pro choice. Right, very very much so, very much so. You know, you can get your standard, you can get your deluxe, you there can you get go. your super deluxe, you can get your super duper duper, you can get your toppermost poppermost. There you go, there you go. Anyway, um, let's start out the little interview clips. There was a discussion I saw online somewhere recently asking about uh, George Martin, George Martin, George Harrison not liking the one of the early mixes of the the White Album and changing it himself, working on it in Hollywood. And at the time, the 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 opinion, and I can't remember again where I saw this, was that they weren't sure if it happened. Well, Ken Mansfield, whose new book, The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert, is uh, com- just coming out, um, talked to me the other day, and he was in the room with George Harrison in Hollywood when George was working on the album. And so he confirmed that this did indeed indeed happen, and he talked about it. And so here's Ken Mansfield talking about George Harrison remixing the White Album. Well, George was there. Uh, we were finishing up the Jackie Lomax tour, and George came in, and he was doing some work on uh, Jackie's stuff, I think. He had this studio book uh, close to his Armand Steiner studio, mm-hmm. uh, close to the Capitol Tower, and he went over one day and, and heard the uh, the ma- the new uh, mix mastering, and he just did not like it. He felt it. I think it was too compressed. He felt it was uh, too just Capitol sterile type. I just think he just uh, he was very disturbed. And he came back and he just went right to work, and he'd had it with the whole project anyway. He just, that project just wore him out, and uh, George was just tired of the whole thing, and he's just, oh, if somebody's going to do this, I guess I'm the guy that has to wrap this thing up and make everything right, so he just buckled down and did it, and um, I'm I'm not positive that's the, uh, the we're the final masters, but at that point in George's mind, he was done with it. He took care, he finished, he redid it and sent it back, so I'm, you know, I'm not sure... Like I said, if that was the final final masters. Oh, okay. But I just um, know how, I know how how he felt about it at the time. Did when and you I was, heard? When, I was there. Okay. Go ahead. When you heard what you heard, though, did it sound compressed to you? No, but I wasn't a producer at that time. <laughs> I was, you know, <clears throat> I wasn't listen, used to listening in detail. I became a producer right there, at, you know, after that, a couple of years after that. But mm-hmm. you know, I don't know what I don't know what George was looking for. Um, I've heard uh, a lot of people say things about a mastering or a mixing and, and other producers. I go, oh, I don't hear that, but they do, you know. And I would hear certain things. I always wanted my my mixes and my masters would be very open, a lot of space somewhere. And Peter Asher, his mixes are much more compressed than mine. He and I would work side by side in the studio when I was doing Jesse Kohler and he was doing Linda uh, Ronstadt. Mm-hmm. And I felt I felt my records mixes were more open and his were more compressed. And when I heard him in the studio, I liked mine better. But then when I heard him on the radio, his came across the radio better. So Peter had an e- ear for knowing. You know how how the public will hear a record better than I did, and uh, obviously he became a much better producer than I did. Um, I also, in the course of putting putting this show together, talked to Brian Southall, who has done a number of Beatle books. He did a book on Abbey Road, which it actually isn't really a Beatle book per se, but it, obviously it has to do with the Beatles. But he wrote a, a great book uh, on uh, Northern Songs that goes through the whole Northern Songs legalese uh, situation. And he's also uh, done other books on other people. He's done uh, a book on the Hollies. He's done he's done many books. But anyway, he, his new book, and it's uh, and right as of the time we were talking, it was available in England, but uh, I'm told that it's probably going to come over here. It's called The White Album, Revolution, Politics, and Recording the Beatles and the World in 1968. And he did a book last year 
on the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper that basically was the same concept, concept where uh, it's a, a kind of an A-side, B-side thing where the A-side is about the album and the B-side is the world at large uh, at the release of the album. And that's what... That's kind of similar to one of the things I always loved about Ian McDonald's book. Mm-hmm. Is how he has that whole chart in the back where you can see what else was happening in the world and in the UK. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it, Southall does the same thing except he goes into it in a lot of detail. It's right. basically from a British perspective, obviously because he's a he's a he's a Englishman. Right. But it does go through American events because there was a lot happening over here with the Vietnam War and you know, and protests and things like that. Yeah, because those Beatles shook up those kids. They sure, they sure did. They sure did. Um, and Brian was very opinionated, very, very opinionated. And we had a, a very long conversation. And here's some of what Brian had to say. First of all, he talked. Uh, I asked him about his favorite White Album tracks, and he talked about those. You know, it, it, it was an album that at the time I didn't appreciate. And I still take the sort of Alan Parsons view that there are some cracking tracks on there and there are some things that I never want to play again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know. <laughs> um, what songs What songs do you think are the most significant? Or I guess, or, or even, uh, what's your favourites? Oh, you know, you, you've got to say that back in the USSR is a cracking, you know, rock song I mean you know if you're ever going to have a single and I you know that that was the record that should have been the single and every record company of EMI around the world went oh great that's going to be the first single then and of course and it wasn't uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and they you know in some cases in, around the world with certain bands you could take a single off a record and not tell the band because it was too far away for them to know uh, but you certainly didn't do that with the Beatles so you know I think Back in the USSR is, 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 is a great great rock and roll song mm-hmm. um uh, Blackbird, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful song. It's it's up there with 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 Yesterday from that wonderful Paul's ability to write. You know, as an artist said to me once, you know, he writes the, some of the greatest melodies you'll ever hear and some of the worst words mm-hmm. lyrics you'll ever hear. But that's the story. While my guitar gently weeps is just an extraordinary piece of musicianship from from George, which you love. And my why are my particular favourite is actually rock. I love Rocky Raccoon, and I love Richie Haven's version of Rocky Raccoon. I think it's one of the great cover versions of Beatles songs ever. Um, and then there's other things that you sort of look at. Really, you know, Honey Pie, I, I, be on Revolution, you know, and some of the stuff that I, I think Helter Skelter is a great rock and roll track. It's slightly disturbing, but it's a great song. Uh, you know, happiness is a warm gun. Savoy truffle. There's a, things in there that you went and obladi oblada, which is you know just a sort of catchy pop song that you know somebody had a number one record with. But it's you know you can't imagine that Mr. Lennon was a fan of obladi oblada. Your uh, uh, your book uh, uh, actually takes kind of an interesting view in that you look at the al- the white album not only as music but you also look at it as cultural history why did you why did you do it this way uh well because there was one the the, the, the the book i did the previous year 19 last year mm-hmm. uh which was a similar theory which was the 50th anniversary of sergeant pepper mm-hmm. which was done uh in 1967 and that was the, that was done uh in the same way, and that was where we sort of started the idea with the, with the publishers. But the the idea was, I went to the publishers and said, you know, Sergeant Pepper's 50 years, you know, should be something. There'll be something out there. You should consider doing something. So we sat down and talked about it, and came up with this idea of the A side, the B side, the the, the out of an album. If you're old enough to remember an album. Um, and the A-side being the record um, in all its glory, the cover, the reception, and you know, talking to people who were there and involved, and so on, and people who bought it and fans. And then the B-side being the year and what happened and what made it socially, in terms of politics, sport, whatever, um, which was a sort of, you know, I, I think a, a, a unique way of doing it. Um, 
And then we moved on to do, to do the same thing. When we did Sgt. Pepper, I don't think the plan was necessarily to do the White Album in 68, but um, it seemed to have been well received. And uh, the idea was that we, you know, they came to me and said, do we want to do the White Album and 68? Um, so that's where the, the, the whole idea came from. And this one carries on that idea of the A-side being the record and the B-side being the year and the news and the events that took place um which was which is the a most fascinating part of it i mean i you know i was a fan of the records and i bought them in in the, in the 60s um but it's amazing what you forget uh, <laughs> i was i mean 20, 1968 the white album came out i was 21 uh and you forget you know what's what went on all that time ago uh, you remember what happened to you your you know personal memories but all the stuff that went on around it, uh, and that that was sort of quite fascinating to, to go back and, and look back over that, and and talk to people and who were there, not just involved in the album and the music business, but were just you know around. They were doing whatever they were doing at school or college or whatever they were doing to get their memories and and uh, you know uh, anecdotes of of the year. So that's sort of where it came from. One of one of the questions I had to ask both Ken Mansfield and Brian was the question of whether they, as writers, have thought through the years, uh, or have written about through the years, whether the White Album was a a unified album, or whether it was a, a an album of each Beatle and a backing band. On, in that regard, we have opinions here from both Ken Mansfield and Brian Southall. Mansfield, remember was in the middle of it. He was there during the creation of the White Album. Um, Southall was on, was, although he was at one point with with EMI, um, he, his opinion is a bit, is, is a bit different here, um, or from a different perspective. Did you, how did you see it? Did you see it as a band album, or did you see it as a... no. Because I thought it was the least. This is just me. I thought it was the least band album I'd ever heard. Um, it sounded like a bunch of individual recordings. Um, I I didn't see a unity in the concept of the of the music. I didn't see a consistency of sound. I felt like I was listening to a lot of solos, but it, but it sounded like it sounded like a bunch of solos. To me, the Beatles were this band. You know, it, you think about all the records they made. How Gosh, it was just it was just Beatle records, and this one felt like a bunch of um, individual efforts. And I didn't realize when uh, they were making the album because I was over there during that time. I never realized there was any uh, problems like that. I just never sensed it. So when I when I heard it, that was my reaction. And was interesting to me, uh, Stevens. I came, they came and did Abbey Road after they did. The White Album and the Let It Be album, which was, you know, contentious in, in ways. And then mm-hmm. they do Abbey Road, which sounded to me like a Beatle album again. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's strange. It's strange. But I'm with a lot of people, the White Album is their favorite, and a lot of people is not their favorite. Well, then, the album itself, um, if we go back to the yeah. to the uh, the album itself, um, they're, they're, uh, one of the things, and, and I did go to the session in Hollywood, um, and one of the things that they've been pushing, and actually it's not really a new quote, but it, it's out there now, is that it was a group album and not the individual album that that writers have always called it. How do you feel about that? Is it Do you see it as a group album, or do you see it as uh, an album where the four of them were trying their individuality? I think without question they're trying their individuality. I'm not, I, you know, I'm... I don't know whether that's something that that's is that a thing that Apple is putting forward or as a proposal or that that it was a group album that's coming from Apple. Well, there's I mean there's various yeah. quotes Ringo said at the time that yeah. that they were a band. You have quotes in the in your book that yeah. say yeah no no I I think without question that it was it, it's it's probably a bit about there was always going to be a time when. They would, you know, Lennon would throw something into a McCartney song, and McCartney would throw something into a Lennon song, and maybe the two of them would throw something into a George song. Or that—that that, that was, you know, you couldn't be 
together or not together, but you couldn't be that close to it without actually having, you know, throwing in something because that was the nature of, of the Beatles up to that point. Um, had always been, you know, the idea that everything was worked as a Lennon McCartney song we know to be, you know, completely untrue and that they were, many of them were individual songs and, you know, which other people contributed to or in some cases contributed nothing to. Um, so I think there was an F, there was undoubtedly some some um, group involvement in this stuff in various tracks, some tracks. But from talking to people who were in the studio and working on this stuff, um, you know, the, it was unquestionable, there's no doubt that, that these some of these people went off uh, and did what they wanted to do on their own. Um, well, I, I think it was the, the idea that you know that they were still a group is 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 true and valid, and it was interesting that um, two people said to me exactly the same thing: that it was whoever's track it was, it was them and a backing band. So it was John Lennon and a backing band, and the backing band happened to be the three other Beatles, or it was Paul McCartney and a backing band. So they did, you know, they did record a lot of this stuff together. Uh, they did do it together, but it was one their song, their concept, their idea, and the other three sort of played on it with wild enthusiasm or not, as the case may be. And it was a couple of people who said exactly the same thing, who were there, who went into the studio and saw this stuff going on and went, oh yeah, it was, you know, they... It was, you know, uh, for the first time ever, it was John Lennon, you know, and the Beatles, or Paul McCartney and the Beatles as a backing band, rather than four of them. So I think it was a combination of both, but unquestionably it was the time when they started to, yeah, you know, uh, to push forward their own identity, their own ideas, um, and, and rightly so. Um, you know, they were, as I say, they were, you know, they were grown adults. They weren't the, the mop top fab four anymore. They all had musical ideas and they had great musical ability. So it was, you know, it was, it was, it was no surprise that they were going to do this. It was just, I mean, you really can't, the one, you know, the one thing that was funny at the, um, at the Capitol session and, and that, um, I should I should say we're we're going to play one more interview and that's my interview with Giles that I did in Los Angeles and the first thing he as he introduced the listening session is that it was a band album it was uh, and they're definitely trying to I wouldn't I don't know if they're I've said they're trying to change the narrative but and may, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they are definitely bringing this into focus that it was a a band album, and even Ringo has has said it's a band album, and, and as Giles pointed out, Ringo left during the sessions and came back. Yeah, but that that, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. People have no, I no, I know that. You know, I mean, that's always that's always used as an example, right, mm-hmm. of of attention. But hey, what about part two where they had flowers waiting for him? You know, right. so you know, uh, you know, <laughs> their interactions. Mm-hmm. You know, you get pissed off at somebody one day, and then you forget about it because you're engaged in a common in a common activity that you're both invested in and a creative process, which is, the, that's what they love. That's what they want to do. And, and, and they respected each other's skills, even if they didn't always want to draw on them at every moment, you know, like, I don't want you playing on this or whatever. But I mean, I, I think we, I, I think sometimes we forget that they were just like four young guys who had this really weird life. And, <laughs> you yeah, know, that, so we, that's, that's true. That's very true. I mean, uh, you know, even, you wonder how sometimes how they got through it all because it was so crazy. I mean, it was it was a unique exp- it was a unique and I don't mean unique in necessarily a good way. Um, it was a very I mean think of you know the all the craziness that they went through on tour and you know right. that I mean, kind they of had thing. a really bizarre life for many many years. Mm-hmm. You know? I totally understand why George became a uh, you know obsessed with gardening. I mean, I really I mean, as, as somebody who has recently become somewhat obsessed with gardening this past season, I totally understand it because it, it, it's really it's, it's a it's a very calming meditative thing. But I would it'd be interesting to trace that, you know, to trace that back and see. Um, I mean, as far as I can remember, anyone who ever wrote about this, 
you know, always, always called it, a, always earmarked it as each Beatle with a backup band. And right. But you know, the really important thing that, I mean, several, but like, what did, how did the fans experience it at the time is the question too, you know? Well, the, the, and I think that the, the separate photos were very, uh, you know, they remain a very important aspect of this experience. Of what about this what about the music and especially the outtakes? I mean, you you've heard the outtakes. Yeah, but mostly I think you know they were they were having a lot of fun doing their craft, you know, mm -hmm. um, with great sense of purpose, right? Mm -hmm. You can, I mean, that certainly comes through. Right. Let Let's get to the the last part of the show, and that's the interview I did with Giles Martin um, on the 30th of September uh, in Los Angeles. Um, let me preface this by saying we refer to a lot of, or I should say I refer to a lot of things during the interview as things I heard uh, in there. Where, what I'm talking about, we had just come out of the Capitol listening session where we had heard 15 tracks, uh, five Escher demos, five outtakes and five five one remixes and so a, a lot of the conversation refers directly or some of the conversation refers directly to some of the stuff that i had just heard but uh, there are some general questions too and some great uh, some really interesting comments that he makes anyway i'm gonna this is gonna play through it's about uh, 10 minutes long and here we go. But it's well worth listening to. Yes, it is. It is. Here, here we go. I, the first question is: um, Let me let me just say first of all, for anybody listening, I'm with Giles Martin. Um, how long did this project take from from beginning to end? We we actually started uh, listening to stuff uh, at the end of November in 2017. Okay. And then I suppose I finished the last thing and signed off and everything in May 2018. But it wasn't constant, otherwise you'd go mad. Um, but long time. I mean, it's a lot of, there's a lot of material to go through. Well, yeah, with two and albums. And with two albums and also the way they're recorded. Um, that it's really important that we listen to everything for the fans and for the Beatles. You can't right. skip stuff. You can't have a bad day at the office. And so, in a way, you kind of do it. You dip in out. Like the, all the studio outtakes, I would dip in and out of and not do in one block because otherwise I'd go mad. Right, right. Well, um, you did the, the pepper and you've done this. What was the difference in doing pepper and this? What was there, were there different challenges with, with pepper? Yeah, I suppose with pepper, that everyone was focused on the remix of the, of the record because of this fact that band's mix was the mono mm -hmm. and we you know almost took the influence of the mono and mixed the stereo with the white album we had to find out why we were doing it before we agreed to do it if that made sense we started doing it without it being officially you know it's not as though we have marketing meetings and they go we're going to release this this time well and you kind of hinted at it in that in, yeah and everybody was going we're doing the white album next right and you were going no 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 but yeah, you, I, you have. I don't agree to these things. Like, Sergeant Pepper I didn't agree to. Oh, really? Yeah, Sergeant Pepper I started doing and said, listen, I'll start doing this, but I don't think, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And we started doing, I'm only going to do it if it's if it sounds good. Okay. And I thought it sounded good, and I was like, we, we should do this now. And they were like, okay. I, mean, I don't know what if I said we shouldn't do this, that if I may get someone else. But I do have that trust. You know, Paul will say to me, what do you think? And I'll go, this is what I think. And mm hmm I suppose I do to a certain extent because I think it's really important that you're it's really important not just print Beatles ashtrays and sell them it's, not, it's the same but it's not it's important that I don't just don't just work on stuff so people can collect them and put them on shelves you know I want people to listen to things and be and feel love and feel emotion and feel inspired by things and that's why I do it that's the reason mm -hmm. why I do it so you have to dig deep and find that with the Beatles, it's easy because they have a lot of that. But at the right. same time, with the White Album makes you feel a certain way, and you have to make sure that you feel that way when you listen to it. And then, it, then it's the the other thing that drives me is that I go to the studio and I get to press play on tape machines that no one ever hears or tapes no one ever hear. Right. And how do I get other people to experience that? Mm -hmm. Not just the fake of the sacred experience of it, but to be inspired by it. 
And I think if you hear someone talk and have a conversation or you, and then start singing like we did with John with Julia, it kind of emphasizes the genius of the guy opposed to demeans him. Right. Because it's this, oh, it, oh it's, it's that easy. It's that easy, is it? For him, not for us, it's that easy. You can go, yeah, I might just try it like this, I might just do this, and he starts singing, and it's like, this beauty comes out of it. One of my best experiences was, I worked in a concert with Joni Mitchell once, she sat where you are sitting now, about five feet away, and started playing hijira on a, on a guitar. Mm -hmm. And it was like music just came out of her. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, and that's, to me, that's better than anything else. Mm -hmm. And so... That's the motivation behind you. Suddenly, realize that with with all of these bits and bits and bobs in the White Album, the Isha demos and the outtakes, you can tell that story. And I suppose you know, even though remixing an album like the White Album is a huge task, and I, I'm very proud of what we're doing. It sounds good. That was almost less of, of a thing than it was with Sergeant Pepper. Um, the the demos um, were. I got to say that was, I think, the most impressive thing in there. I mean, the five, everything sounded wonderful, but the the upgrade in the quality of the of the demos is just the Easers. Uh, the Easers. Yeah, I, I got to get used to calling them Easers. It I've is a place in England. That's why. That's I know why somebody here. just told me that the other <laughs> yeah. day, and I didn't. I, yeah. I I went okay, and but now you know now that you've said that, I, it's like oh okay, he's right. Um, but. Though the upgrade in that was just really in, in amazing. I mean, I it, you know the stereo and everything yeah. like that. Did you have to do anything to them um, special? Or? No, we mix them. I, d I don't do anything. I try. I, I try my best. I mean, sometimes you know, on eight days a week, we did a little bit. But I try my best to reduce the amount of digital process that goes on in these in these things because it doesn't it doesn't last well enough. You know, you hear records that have been treated in a certain way and. Mm -hmm. It takes away the soul of them. I keep all the dirt and tack. You'll notice actually when the Isha demos started that 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 there's hiss. You know, I yeah. don't take away the hiss because it takes away it. It's, it doesn't it takes away the sound slightly. Um, we clean them to a certain degree, but it's, we just mix and EQ. Just do what we do, really. Um, mm -hmm. Let not not no effects. Um, trying to keep it as as yeah. You, you it's it's a really brash and say, but I do things that I think can make it sound good. Mm -hmm. um, so with those, yeah, we we mix them, but they, they sound good because I found the original tapes in Fry Park. Um, what was the what were some of the uh, more uh, revelatory outtakes that you that you found? Well, I think it varies um, on which which you know you're going through. I mean, for instance, on the Isha demos, uh, Yeah Blues is is sounds like a Robert Johnson track. Mm -hmm. It's it's really amazing. I think I think I actually prefer that to the finished version. Um, uh, on things like Blackbird, you have Paul um, trying different things on Blackbird, and you and you hear him. It's that it's that ability that some people have, and it's a it's an, it, and it's a it's a kind of folk song ability where people can change their guitar and voice interaction until the song sits right. You know, it's, it, and that's the beauty of not overdubbing. Mm -hmm. It's like you're accompanying yourself, and it's almost like there's two people. It's a schizophrenic thing, but right. they, they have to make sure they join and they're, you know, with some of like Blackbird's little counterpoint going on the guitar. Right. Um, more than anything else, the conversations. More than anything else, I presume that the White Album was an angry album when no one got on. The biggest revelation for me was the fact that, as you heard today, I'm not editing stuff, I'm not putting happy conversations on. Where there were dark conversations, I look for dark conversations. There are very few. They seem to be very cohesive as a band. One of the things that you said at the beginning that was that was kind of interesting was you said people have always talked about the White Album as four separate albums, whereas it's really not. Mm. Talk a, a little bit more about that, though. Well, I think that I think you know, with with the. If you look at the end of Hello Goodbye, the video of Hello Goodbye, the Beatles are wearing their four suits and they're waving. Mm -hmm. And they're almost waving goodbye to Beatlemania. And after that, if you look at them, they become four individuals. I mean, Sergeant Pepper, they wear the Sergeant Pepper suits on the front, but they start dressing differently. White Album is very much, that's the case. And I think it's too easy to go, okay, you know, they all went separately. You know, they, 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 if you th if they did write songs separately, more separately. But they did that before. I mean, Fixing a Hole is a Paul song, and Loosen the Sky with Diamonds is a John song, you know, whatever way you look at it. Right. And um, I think that with the White Album, there was this... People thought there was this separation that the band, 
you know, went off and recorded a song. A guy said to me yesterday, but I will, I read, is just Paul on his own. So what's going on there? And I go, well, it's John and Ringo in the background. But I read it, I read it was Paul on his own. I go, well, it, you know, it's not. But I read it, and it's like, wait a second, at what stage are you going to stop, you're going to just listen to the tapes? I mean, as Paul says to me, and there's only four of us, four of us, and we, we don't remember what, what happened. I think a lot was said uh, by John and George in the 70s about the White Album. But I think it's a bit like having a girlfriend, breaking up with her and having a new marriage, where you go, oh, you know what, we didn't have a terribly good time. You know, right. that's that thing. I think that happened in the 70s. My dad saw John in 1980. Before he died, he phoned him up, and they hadn't seen him for about 10 years because, it, because of what John said. My dad said, John, why do you say these things? And he goes, I was high. Hmm. And to my dad, that wasn't an excuse. You know, it, it hurt. So I think that... There's a view of the White Album being this unhappy time. And I don't think it was an unhappy time for them. I think, you know, I'm talking to Ringo anyway about it. And he goes, yeah, it's, I, he, said, he said last year when we were talking about Sgt. Pepper, he announced that we, actually before I started working on it, that we, that we should do the White Album. Because it's, that's the band album. That's the band album. Okay. And this is the person that walked out of the sessions saying this. Right. right. So, I mean, and if you think about the way it was recorded... Much less organized, um, you know, if you take A Day in the Life, which is such a brilliant song, the band laid down the acoustic guitar, piano, congas, uh, tablas, congas, and, sorry, congas and shakers mm -hmm. as a unit, and then they did a drum overdub. The White Album is no drum overdub, it's the band, or if they wanted drums, Ringo played it, and they did 107 takes. Right. You know, not all the time, obviously. Right. And then, it's not 107 takes in one long session it's over a period of days mm -hmm. that they dip in and out of songs but i think they indulged themselves because they didn't play live anymore mm -hmm. this is when they played live okay i think that's on there what was the challenge with with revolution number nine doing the 5.1 mix what was that you you talked about that in there don't the, the, the challenge of revolution number nine is essentially revolution number nine is a stereo and mm -hmm. then it has the george and john and the spoken and the added bits on top of that it's almost like they created the sound bed as a stereo and so in a stereo format, there's very little you can do with that. But in a 5.1 version, because all the other bits you can fly around the room and you can make the stereo small and big and create these spatial things, the, 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 the surround is crazy. The stereo is very straightforward. Because the stereo has a lot of panning on it anyway. Uh -huh. you know, if you listen to the right. stereo, it's like right. going the whole time. It's like, what do I do, pan it more? You know, that thing. But in a surround world, you can do this. And, and suddenly, it, suddenly a voice can come out of your speaker behind you and then... And then the whole thing can erupt. And mm -hmm. When the symphony starts, we goes, Wah! the whole thing goes, Wah! and big, and then goes tiny, tiny again. And mm -hmm. we do that in the surround, and it's great. It took a long time to do, actually, but it was worth doing. Um, it seem, uh, maybe you're the wrong person to ask. Maybe I should have asked Jeff this question. But it seems like they've finally come down to anniversaries. They're finally looking at anniversaries for things. Um, you, know, you did Pepper now. You, you're doing the White Album. The assumption is that we're looking at Abbey Road and Let It Be. Um, why has that thinking changed? Do you know? Have you talked to Paul and Ringo? And no, I'm part of this, I suppose. I'm mean, partly to blame. Um, the idea, I mean, love was interesting because I thought with love I'd happily have my house burned down. But I thought I'd get fired. To be honest, <laughs> I thought that was. I thought the idea of George Martin's son chopping up. Beatles tapes to create a show in Vegas. If I was told about that, I'd say it was a terrible idea. Maybe, and then it, then it came out as a record. I didn't want it to come out as a record. I didn't. I, I wasn't the plan. I love the record. As, well, thank you very much. But it wasn't. That wasn't my. And when they said they were going to release a record, I mean, yes, I said a surround, okay, but as a stereo, it's not meant to be a stereo. It's not meant to be a stereo. And they were like, we need a stereo. I said, not meant to be a stereo. And they released it, and out it came, and and I did, my house didn't get burned down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I did some films, which is surround mixes. We did Hard Day's Night. We did. Um, I didn't do Yellow Submarine. That was before me. Um, Hard Day's Night, Magical Mystery Tour. Um, and then we did Eight Days a Week. And then we did the we did the number ones. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to remix the number one singles. You know, they sound pretty good. And they. Um, Go away. <laughs> we're just we're, we're just talking, about yeah, <laughs> And I, and and and. To do, and they went. It's for video, so mm -hmm. to do a surround, you have to re, we have to remix, otherwise it's be really bad. So we we remixed in, and on the pathway to surround is stereo, and you have to do a stereo. I always do a stereo with on film anyway because I much prefer being in control of the stereo mix than people doing fold downs. 
So we did these stereo mixes for the video, and they went, these sound great. I was like, thank you very much, that's good, because we should put these on CD. I was like, mm -hmm. but we said we weren't going to do this, and they put them on CD, and everyone liked them. And so then when Sgt. Pepper came along, they were like, we should, this, is, this is now getting really risky. And it wasn't until five songs in that I agreed to do the project. I'd started in the project without, you know, saying it's okay to do this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't through arrogance that it was okay to do it. I just thought, I just thought you, you do things because you think it's worth listening to them. Like you do a show because you want to go and see it. And I suppose that opened the door. And then when Pepper came out last year, someone told me it was actually one of the, one of the highest rate, rated critic ma data things that came out. Mm -hmm. Pepper. And people liked it. And I'm incredibly humbled by that more than anything else. And so then that makes the White Album making that decision easier, not the project easier. So I suppose that answers, if that answers the question, it's, it's the fact that there's an acceptance and more and more there is a desire from the fans they want it so but you have to do it in the right way yeah one thing that's that seems to have changed is that the fans voice is really making a bigger bigger difference i mean it's always probably it's always probably made a difference but i think it's making a bigger difference now and you know i mean the the reaction from the reaction from from the you know people like on Facebook and everything is just just been astounding. But you can't. Yeah, but you can't. The passion that people have for the Beatles. You know, it's something. I mean, I you know, on, when my dad was on his deathbed, which he, he, she spent a long time on. I mean, my dad was such a nice man. And uh, and I said to him, I went, I really want to say this. I said, you know, listen, Dad, it's amazing what you did. And, uh, and I see he goes, what do you mean? I goes. You, above anything else, if you think about it, and as a son, you don't want to say this because it's a bit fanny, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan, I'm his son. I said, you signed and recorded the Beatles. Had you not made that decision, there'd be no Beatles in the world. And then he closed his eyes and he went, I did the best I could. And, but the, but the, the reverberations of that, of, of him and the band getting together and performing and creating this world of this universe of sound that's made so much difference to everyone else. And that, that love that comes back towards the Beatles and us that work on the Beatles projects, we can't take that for granted. We have to listen to the fans. And okay. so we, we try to. Thank you, sir. Thank very you. Much. I think he's, a, he's, a, he's, uh, he's, 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 Again, great sense of purpose, like I was saying. I mean, he there, there's a you know he he clearly has great reverence for this music. I think he he um, it's beautiful. I mean, I I think he you know I mean of course he's the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know one one thing one thing in there um, we're taping this on the seventh, and they did a streaming session today from London. I asked him the same basically the same question that they asked him today as to whether we are looking at Abbey Road next right. year, next year. And he does not he did not say no to me and he did not say no today. Now I would bet I would put money on it. I would bet money on it. Mhm. Mm but what, let's get back. So I wanted to say a few things about some of the some of the outtakes that I especially enjoyed, mm -hmm. if I may. Oh. Um, I thought, well, I'll say I'll say the thing I like the best on the whole package first. Mm -hmm. The biggest, the sweetest moment for me on these six discs was the final cut on disc six. The thing they leave you with, which is an, a version of Across the Universe. Really? That will, that will send shivers down, you know, put the hair on your arms will stand up. Really? Okay. That's one that, that's what, you've got me on that one because that's not one that, that hit me that hard. Interesting. Oh, man. It, I, I yeah. Again, it all depends, you know. I hadn't heard this song in a while, you know, I was, you know, certain, you know, I was just kind of, it just grabbed me. I mean, it was just beautiful. It's so simple and his voice is just, it's just magnificent. Hmm. Um, okay. I'll have to, I'll have to take another listen to that one. I also <laughs> loved, I love the inner light, which I think is an underrated song. Okay. I really enjoyed that. 
and I, and what and and lady and the uh, lady Madonna and Savoy Truffle are great if you want to do karaoke. Oh, okay. I'm not a karaoke. I'm not a karaoke person, but okay. But like you can totally. I guess I'm sort of being ill facetious, but like you can sing along with them, and it's like because it's like this great track, but it's like pretty much everything except the vocal, right? Mm-hmm. On both of those, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's just so much fun to sing with them. Um, well, the, the 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 ones that the ones that really stuck with me are the um, while my guitar gently weeps with the Eric Clapton alternate solo. That, yeah, that's that that we, we they played that in in Hollywood, and I was and and every time I've heard it, it's like oh my god, that's just absolutely fantastic. And then the other one is the Helter Skelter, not the thirteen minute version that's cut. That, that, <laughs> Not that, not the slow one. I could not believe what I was listening to. But the fast one, the fast one when he, when Paul just goes crazy. Uh, that one oh, is that one. That's a, well. That's the shorter of the two outtakes. Right, but they're both pretty long, right? Is that no, no, no. The, no, the second one's. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't have the time here. I, right. uh, the okay. first one yeah. is thir- is thirteen minutes. Uh, that one, um, but and that's the one. Because uh, I, the first I asked Giles the first question in Hollywood. I said, everybody had wanted the the really long Helter Skelter. Why wasn't it on here? You said that take, the thirteen minute take, is it resembles the the long one, and so it gives you an idea of what the long one is. And I actually didn't like the thirteen minute take. I like the longer one, which is closer to the original version well let me let me let's let me let's kind of finish off the discussion with this question does has listening to all this stuff given you a better opinion of the album of the original thirty song mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. better opinion has it has it up has it lifted up your opinion of the album at all? It ha- I would say it has for me. For me, no, because no, I mean, not so. well, I, in just, just, just a, I mean, it's given me a better appreciation of it, which I suppose is probably what this is all about, anyway. In other words, to see the work that went into it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said earlier, like I said at the beginning, the mix, the new mix, definitely gives you a uh, a better feel of. The musicianship and the and the complexity of the right. of their playing and what they were what they were trying to do and and all that you get to I mean you hear that better on the new mix than you did before. Um, yeah, I, I think that I mean in that sense, yes, it does add to my appreciation. I mean, I remember when I heard the Pepper remix, I was I was very uh, moved by it, and I thought that it really you really did once. In other words, you were sort of confronted again with the master, the the, the artistry of it. It just mm-hmm. kind of so in your face, and I guess so. And that's so. Yes, I would say that's true here as well. Um, but I didn't necessarily need all the outtakes. To okay. That no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, that that's a very valid opinion. I, you know, the one thing about the Pepper set versus this one is they went from the the Pepper set, and even Giles mentioned this is that they used the mono mix as a starting point. There, they I don't know that they did that here, but they obviously knew what they were doing as far as I mean, they obviously found somewhere to go with it, and that's. You know that's what's what's interesting here. So, the, I mean, the question the question basically will be if you know for people who who haven't bought it uh, as of you know that are listening to this and and you know haven't purchased it is you know whether or not they need it. Um, well, what, if I, you know we're talking, you're right, exactly. And how do you answer that question, right? The other, I, one more thing I want to talk about is Revolution Nine. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Because. Um, you know, I mean, you know, again, and you know, my one of my big interests in all of this is how the fans responded and the whole fan experience aspect of all of this, mostly then, but now too, to some extent. Uh, well, yes, definitely now as well. So, you know, it was always, you know, fans for the most part did not like this, and and um, Aaron Krewitz does this 
thing, sort of a, I guess, a survey of sorts. It's not terribly, I don't think it's scientific in any way, but but he, you know, where, where people like, you know, building on this riff of, well, maybe it should have been a single record, which I guess was George Martin's preference. Right, that, well, he, he, he was quoted <laughs> as saying right. something like that, yeah. Right. Like, pick the best 14, right? Mm-hmm. So that's very, you know, that's another very intriguing Beatles parlor game that fans engage in, you know. So, anyway, so he does, so uh, he and I and, and uh, Dan Bigadio did a talk on this uh, in over the summer in Newton, Mass. And Anyway, so it got me thinking a lot about, we each had to, like, pick our 14 and defend them. Anyway, it was a lot of fun, but Aaron's uh, research has shown that no, like, nobody ever picks the uh, Revolution 9. Like, nobody ever includes it. And I've read in other places where, you know, that this is somehow, this is a certain... Um, you know, the, the fact that fans didn't appreciate what this was, that it was, a, you know, a different kind of art, a different kind of thing to do with sound and all that. And and I think that there's a certain amount of snobbery, I think, around that that, that bugs me a little bit. I, mean, but, I think most people have, uh, uh, I think, if people didn't accept Revolution Number no. 9, at the, uh, you know, when the, when the album came out, and, I, and uh, that's an interesting point. Um, I think a lot of people are used to it now. I think, uh, yeah. but people always say, "Oh, I always skip it or whatever." You know, I don't skip it. I never. I, and and it's oh, interesting okay. that you. It's interesting that you mentioned that because two reasons. Number one, the outtake revolu- of Revolution One, the the long I forget how yes, long it is, yeah, has, shows a definite connection between. You know the, the, all the revolutions, and and yes, it, yes, it kind yes. of just kind of filters into number nine. It starts out with revolution, uh, the, you know, revolution one, and then it filters into nine. It's like, where did that come from? And but I mean, we've ar- we'd already had a a preview of that several years ago when a, an outtake came out that was a little more, you know, uh, was a little more of that. And so right. uh, this yeah, is just I, another I link in that. that. Another link in that chain, um, which is really kind of interesting. I, I did hear that link to it, um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, but, but the um, you know I think I, a couple of things I want to say about it. I um, you know people. I, this is not necessarily uh, people who did or didn't like Revolution Nine, but I think part of the appeal of the Beatles for people. Um, particularly by 1968, were that, you know, like they, the world was crazy. Like a lot of really strange things were happening. Things were changing very quickly. There's a lot of violence, assassinations, the convention, all that stuff. And and so people, you know, whether it was things about the outside world or, or things that people were experiencing in their personal lives, that the Beatles were always a source of comfort, right? Mm-hmm. The, Be- the Beatles were a place you went to feel better or calmer. I mean, as people do with music in general, but, you know, certainly the Beatles were, were, were very much, it was like, uh, you know, just want to leave me alone listening to, listening to the Beatles. So the fact that the album itself was, was described as chaotic, I think sometimes, you know, people, uh, scary, you know, that was not, you know, that, and so Revolution 9 especially, I mean, I listened to it today again, and it's, it's very chaotic. It's it's very chaotic. You know what it reminded me of? Well, the other thing I, I never knew or was aware of, or I don't remember being aware, was the panning that goes on back and forth. Right, and that's one thing that, that Giles mentioned in, in Los Angeles, is that the 5-1 mix of that, he said it's. It, he said something like it was the scariest thing he'd ever worked on. Yeah. And, and, you can, and you can imagine all those sounds coming in all around you. It's like... Yikes! Yeah. You know, and and I uh, and I've, I've. It reminds me of when I'm in the. It also it's like like it's very urban. It's very. Um, it, it reminds me of being on a crowded subway. This is how it hit me today. Like you're on a crowded subway and you're hearing snippets of all this conversation and you just like can't wait to get away from it. <laughs> you know, in other words, that this world whooshing by with people and their issues and these sounds and the sports and the, the, it was like it, it was the world. You know, it was like a it was a real chaotic world. Really? See, I don't. I I I'm. I guess I'm so used to hearing it that I just let it envelop me and and take and take me where it's going. 
Well, yeah. that's where it's right. I mean, I might listen to it tomorrow and get something else. But that's what it felt like to me today. That it was, it was, it was. Um, and, and it's again, like it's very, you know, I, I when I was listened to it back in the day, like we didn't skip it. I mean, I, I we just listened to it and mm-hmm. you know, kind of, you know, like they were like before we went on the air. It's one of something about standing still, and you know, made the joke about we are standing. And in other words, it's become part of, you know, it's it's Beatles stuff, and and so you know it, like you know Beatles stuff, but it's 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 kind of off putting. I mean, it, it it's very intense. Oh yeah, no, there's no there's no question about that. And it's even more intense now. Right. <laughs> Right, right. I, it's definitely more intense. Like, if it scares you then, it's really going to scare you now. Right, right. Um, let's. I, 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 this has been fun. Um, I want to thank you for Candy for for doing this um, discussion. Um, as I said at the beginning, Candy will be uh, a contributing editor to the show, and you will hear her often and i appreciate um uh her being here candy you have any final thoughts to say about the album uh, i do actually go ahead one thing i wanted to say that go. again under the category of you know no one has thought about this before um you know they made this or at least i haven't read this as part of the commentary that you know they had this experience of medit of going to india living there, meditating, you know, and whatever meditation does or doesn't do. But they also um, wrote these songs. So they wrote these songs in a frame of mind that was new to them in a lot of different ways. And they also, it was the first real downtime that they had in, in a long time. And, you know, they were in this different kind of landscapes you know in other words the way that that whole experience was bracketed out of their usual worlds which of course were crazy you know were really you know were, were crazy anyway but <laughs> but that they were doing all the you know the, and the fact that they'd been meditating a lot so these songs were written in a sense under the influence to, of whatever the meditation did or didn't do for them because they were meditating at that time right I mean they were into it then right you know so I think that you know you know, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what point I'm making, other than that it's interesting to think about that. Say what you will about these songs and the nature themes and the animals and the chaos. You know, in other words, all the whole package. Um, it was reflecting that new state of mind that they had learned to inhabit. So I think that that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. There's no question that there's. There was a whole lot going on with them at that time. So I also want to say that Sour Milk C would have been a good replacement for Piggies. Really? Yeah, I think it's a great song. It, it yeah, it is a good song. Uh, Jackie Lomax. Um, he he act, I, that was actually you know done by Jackie Lomax, but uh, yeah, that would have been that's interesting. I I don't know that I'd ever heard anybody say that before. Well, in other words, if you're going to swap, assuming you don't want to give him a, you know, in other words, if you wanted to swap out a Harrison song. Right. right. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Long, Long, Long either, although they did improve the vocal significantly. You can hear the vocal now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I, th- I think that Sour Milk Sea could have been on that record for sure. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I basically have said what I had to say at the beginning. I mean, I think the the mix definitely does justice for this. As you say, though, the question is, you know, whether or not, you know, it, it it's going to be nece- You know, people feel that it's necessary. I wish, you know, everybody could hear it. I um, I wish that they had packaged or they had put out a configuration with the outtakes rather than the Easter demos, but. Um, the Easter demos, if you've heard the bootleg versions, the Easter demos on the new set are just absolutely amazing in the sound. Um, yeah, the sound is really nice. It, um, it, it is, it is. And it, there's all sorts of extras that come with it. There's the huge book. Um, the book, I'm not sure that the book is, is that much of a... Um, the book isn't as necessary as the, the music, obviously. The, the music is what stands... And the you should let people know also that the book is 168 pages. Right, 
Right. Uh, and the, the 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 super deluxe set is also numbered, um, yeah. as is the original as the original album was. Um, I want to mention again um, the uh, two authors that we had um, that uh, who were featured in the interviews. Ken Mansfield, um, who was former U.S. manager for Apple Records, his book is The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert, um, and that should be out uh, soon. I'm not sure exactly when uh, I, I have the I have the press release here, and I don't see, but I th- believe it's not out yet. It should be out very shortly if it's not out already. And the um, Brian Southall's book is The White Album, Revolution, Politics, and Recording, The Beatles and the World in 1968. And uh, that has a forward by Chris Thomas. That is available in England. It's been out since early October. Um, and like I said, there are. it's possible that it will be available through Amazon here, but it is available on Amazon UK. Um, and, it's a, and like I said, it's a, it's a very interesting book. It's 192 pages. Um, and it, it has a lot of pictures uh, of both the Beatles and world events at the time. goes through the whole year, uh, month by month, and talks about uh, uh, things going on um, at the time. Whereas uh, Ken Mansfield's book talks not only about um, the rooftop concert, which he attended, but it also talks about uh, his whole time with Apple. It's got a great set of pictures uh, in the middle of the book by Tommy Hanley, um, that I had not seen before, uh, so uh, it's it, it, anyway. So those uh, those books, uh, and I will have links on my uh, that's what I want Beatles store page on Facebook um, to get uh, both of those books. In any event, this has been a blast, uh, yeah. and we will have a new Beatles news brief uh, soon with news. Um, this is kind of news because the set will be out on Friday. But uh, I hope that we have helped you uh, in deciding whether or not to buy it or, or just enjoying it. Um, so, Candy, again, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, contributing editor, Candy Leonard, uh, author of Beetleness, which, by the way, if you don't have Beetleness, you need to get it. Correct? <laughs> Is there, so. is, there any, is there anything? Any, let me ask you if there's anything going on with with the book. Um, are you doing anything, or I'm not going to New Jersey, <laughs> um, I, which I actually regret uh, to the White Album Conference. Um, well, you know, people, I, I don't know what's happening with it, and people are reading it, loving it, uh, thanking me for telling the story, for documenting this amazing thing that us first generation fans were. You know, we were born at the right time, and we got to see this. You, you, know? re- you recently just did some writing for Ken Womack. Yeah. Talk about talk about that and where that's going to appear, and how people can get that. Well, um, the, as it was written for Ken, uh, it will be in a anthology uh, on Beatles fandom that's going to be published next year by Oxford University Press. So it's it's really designed for an academic audience. Um, but you know, it's the Beatles. So if you're a Beatles fan, it's it's going to be interesting, uh, even though it might be written with lots of you know references and excessive verbiage and whatnot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wrote a piece on. Um, I, I guess I can say what I wrote about. I I I, I did an, a a, a, an, a very pro Beatles and pro fan analysis of. Beatles fandom basically as a de facto secular religion and you know it's kind of it, it's a it's sort of a sociological cultural analysis but it's um, you know it, it, it'll probably be a little bit controversial which is okay but um, yeah so uh, that'll be interesting and probably pieces of that might appear in other places after a while I'm not sure okay and maybe we can talk about that on a, on a future show that would be Sounds like something that would we could get get into. Um, in any event, um, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for all for listening and peace and love, peace and love. <laughs>